I believe in giving to missions. Uh, it's not just a message to me, it's a life. I, uh, I got saved in 1976. I was only four years old. No, it's not true. <laughs> I got saved in 1976. In 1980, I was on the mission field. So I got saved, and I actually got saved in an Assemblies of God church, too. And uh, the pastor that preached that night, I got saved. He's still a very uh, dear friend of mine. He's 74, 75 years old. He's still pastoring. I speak in his church in Florida every year when I go back to the States. And so I had quite an encounter with God. I got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. Two years later, I got married. Two years, then went to Bible school. And then after that, in 1980, moved to the Philippines. And so I'm in my 30, going into my 38th year of living in Asia. So missions isn't just a message. And giving is more than what you can fit in an envelope. You know, if we're going to reach the world, what we're going to have to give is bigger than what you can put on paper. Uh, sometimes God wants your money. Sometimes God wants your time. Sometimes he wants you. And you know, the Bible says we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, we need to glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are his. And if we really belong to him, then giving to reach the world should not really be hard because God's heart is for the world. And I'm glad to be here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, um, I love missions conferences because not many churches do them. Too many churches have become very uh, self-focused and self-centered just on what they're doing and they're missing the fact that uh, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. God loves the world and if you want to get the heart of God, you have to continue to think about reaching the world. And the avenue by which God is going to reach the world is the local church. It's, the, it's not just the giving, but it's also the praying and it's also the going. Some of you are going to take trips. Maybe some God will call some of you to actually move to another nation. But you're either going or you're sending or you're praying, but all of us need to be actively involved in, in reaching the world with the gospel. The fact that we're able to sit in this wonderful building today and gather as a congregation is because I don't know how many years ago, but sometime in the past, missionaries brought the gospel to Malaysia. Hundreds of years ago, missionaries brought the gospel to America. You know, Jesus was not born in America. Uh, I was, uh, last night, I had a dear friend of mine who was here. He also has a church here in, uh, in KL. He's a Norwegian missionary. Norway has a thousand year history of Christianity. Uh, and Norway and Denmark and Finland, if you know the history of these nations, uh, this is where the Vikings came from. And if you've ever watched much on uh, uh, National Geographic or the History Channel or just watching movies, how many know the Vikings were not nice people? Everywhere they went, they brought destruction and they looted and they burned and they invaded and they, and they came in and they conquered. But they were conquered by something more powerful than them. Because when they begin to come into certain nations, when they went into England and other nations, they experienced people who knew Jesus. And the gospel invaded Norway, and now Norway is a different nation. Every nation of the world gets confronted with the gospel. And one of the countries that you're reaching out to, Nepal, actually Nepal is a first generation uh, Christian country. There are some people in Nepal that are some of the first known believers in the nation today. It's less than 70 years old. Whereas Norway has a thousand year history of Christianity. America has hundreds of years of history of Christianity. I don't know how many, how long the, the history of Christianity is in Malaysia, but I believe it's a lot more than what you have in, in Nepal. And so when we have a conference concerning missions, it's the heart of God. If you want to catch the heart of God, you will find in the heart of God people of every tongue, of every tribe, of every nation, of every nationality. God loves the nations of the world. And this unstoppable gospel, when it goes into a nation, light always overcomes darkness and life always overcomes death. And, and the hope and the joy and the peace that Jesus brings always is greater than hopelessness and despair and anxiety and confusion. 
But somebody has to go, someone has to preach it, and then you need those that send them. I want to share a message with you because besides just encouraging you to sow into missions and reach the nations of the world, I believe that God wants you to reach your nation. Oh, not one amen. That's very sad. Come on now. And I'll give you one more chance. I believe God wants you to touch your nation. I believe that, that Jesus wants to live big in Malaysia. And who's he going to use? Yeah, come on, say us. Look at the person next to you and say, I think he's talking to you right now. Look at the person on the other side of you and tell them, listen carefully, I think this is for you. The strength of our Christianity is not going to be demonstrated and performed just at our church service. The strength of our Christianity needs to be in everyday life. Amen. This is not a theater where you come in and you watch a performance. You sing a few songs and you watch a performance and you say, okay, what does this guy have? Let's see what he, he can do today. That's not what our Christianity is all about. It's about Jesus alive and functioning in our everyday lives and showing up and showing off where we live, where we go to school and where we work as we take his life and his joy and his peace out into a world that's dying. Luke chapter 7 Verse 11, let me share this story with you because I believe that God wants to impart something into your hearts today besides just stirring you concerning missions. Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Now it happened the day after that they went into a city called Nain and many of the disciples went with him in a large crowd. Say large crowd. In the Bible, a large crowd usually can be anywhere between three to 5,000 people. So I want you to visualize there's anywhere between three to 5,000 people that are following Jesus. When he, when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. The only son of his mother and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. Say large crowd. So there's another large crowd. One crowd is coming into the city. Another crowd is coming out. One crowd is following Jesus, the other crowd is following a widow and, and a coffin. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came and he touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all and they glorified God saying, a great prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people. I want to go through this story and just give you some, some truths here that I believe can help stir your heart. Besides just looking at this and going, wow, this is really, really great story. And, and we look at what Jesus did and, and then we go on and, and not really understand what he's wanting to do in our lives today. The Bible says that a large crowd was following him. And usually when people are following Jesus, they know they're going to be fed. They know, they know they're going to be helped. They're looking for answers. They're looking for healing. And they're following him because of the things that they have seen and the things that they have heard. And when you're following Jesus, you're following life. And this crowd that's following Jesus is not a sad crowd. It's a joyful crowd. It's, it's a crowd that's full of life and hope. There's rejoicing. There's celebration because of all the things that they've seen. Then they confront another crowd with a widow who's mourning. She's grieving. She's sad. She's followed by a large crowd also, thousands and there's weeping and there's sadness, there's hopelessness, there's probably fear. She has no husband. This is her only son. What is she going to do in the future? What's her future going to be look like? And she's surrounded with grieving and sad people. One crowd is following Jesus. It's happy. It's full of life. The other crowd is sad and grieving, and it's following a coffin. Two crowds carrying two opposite things, they meet at a gate. One has Jesus, one has death. Jesus always brings something new into the crowd that he is with. Life, hope, 
mercy, healing, provision, and an awareness of God in their life. People with testimonies of daughters who have been set free, servants healed, sons delivered, things that they have seen and heard. But even if you're traveling in the crowd that's following Jesus, even when you follow him, you still get faced with challenges. How many know that walking with Jesus doesn't mean that life is free from challenges? Myself, uh, my wife and I, six years ago, uh, during, uh, I think it was November, my wife was diagnosed with uh, dengue fever. You have dengue fever in Malaysia. Um, it was actually the third time my wife has had dengue. And so when we went to the hospital, uh, they diagnosed her with dengue and pneumonia at the same time. She got out of the hospital about a week uh, or so later. That was uh, right before Christmas. And then we come into January. And then she's diagnosed with uh, stage three cancer and tuberculosis at the same time. It was not a good, good time. We both love him with all of our hearts. We've been following him and serving him, but how do we know following him doesn't mean that life is without challenges. Just to make a long story short, that was six years ago. My wife is very much alive. She is healed. She is whole. She is totally cancer-free. Amen. So just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean that life doesn't have its challenges and its changes. These two crowds come together and it says when Jesus saw her. Now too many times when, as we're progressing in life and, and, and we're happy with where we're at and we're, we're happy with what we have and when we get confronted with something that's sad and hurting and, and wounded and dark, we just kind of step aside and let it go by and we look at it and we go, wow, that's, that's really sad. We look at people's conditions, we look at their situations that look hopeless, that look sad, that look dark, and we just kind of step aside and we let it pass by us. But you know, that's not the way this story goes. What came out of the city had sadness and death and, and grieving, but it got confronted with the power of God. And what was dead became alive, what was dark became light. Because hope always confronts hopelessness. Understand, the unstoppable gospel is light and life and mercy and strength. And it doesn't step aside or move aside and allow what is sad and dark and dead to, task, to pass by. It confronts it because it looks at it. The Bible says when Jesus saw her. If we're going to take this unstoppable gospel into our world, that means as we progress in life, there will be things that we see, and when we see it, we cannot look away. Now, my first night here, Friday night, uh, we prayed for, for necks. We prayed that every believer in the church, that their neck would be healed. Because I believe there is a disease in the church today. It's a neck disease and it's called the lookaways. Maybe we need to pray for you this morning. Maybe your neck needs a healing. Because what happens is we progress through life. Let's be honest, none of us like pain, sadness, grieving, or hopelessness. And when we talk about compassion, the Bible says when Jesus saw her, he had compassion on her. Compassion is not sympathy. Sympathy is you feel bad, I feel bad with you. But after a while, we get tired of feeling bad. People are sad, so I will feel sad with you. But listen, if they're sad, you're sad, two people sad, there's no change. I mean, no, if you're sad and I'm sad, I'm still not helping you. You don't want me to be sad. You want me to do something to change your sadness, not join your sadness. And as the church, God doesn't want us to join the sorrow and the sadness that people feel so we feel sad and bad with them. He won't, come on, it's the name of your church. You want to take the sad and the bad and make it glad. You want to bring change to what you see. But you can't change what you don't look at. See, because if you don't look at something, you don't let it touch your heart. What you don't let touch your heart, you will not reach back to bring to touch it. 
And this is what compassion is. Compassion is to look at something, allow it to touch your heart in such a way that you cannot leave it in the condition in which you find it. You must do something to change what you see. That's why when the Bible says that Jesus had compassion, He healed. When he had compassion, he forgave. When he had compassion, he fed the multitudes. When he had compassion, he cast out devils because he allowed it to touch his heart and he could not leave people in the same condition in which he found them. He had to bring change. And because of compassion and desire, that's where the power of God begins to flow. But you must have a heart before the power flows. You have the heart to touch, but then you have the power to change. Because he saw her. He didn't see the crowd. He saw her. And he spoke to her. And he said, do not weep. Now listen, everybody's in a crowd. Today, this is our crowd. How many of you like your crowd? And the kind of crowd that you're in really will determine how you live your life. The kind of crowd that you're in will help you determine how you spend your money, how you use your talents, how you walk with the purposes of God in your life. The kind of crowd that you're in will determine whether people are are encouraging or supporting or hindering a passion that's trying to rise up in you. Jesus brings change to individuals that can bring change to a crowd. What you won't look at, you won't, and you don't let it touch your heart. You won't touch back. You won't touch back with your words. You won't touch back with your hands. You won't touch with your giving. You won't touch with your prayers, and you won't touch with your faith. And if the church doesn't look at the world and see and then respond with our words, with our love, with our faith, with our prayers, and with our giving and with our faith, then the world remains unchanged because the only group of people that can truly bring change to the world is the church. Because Jesus says, I will build my church, my community of believers, my body. I will bring them together and I will live in the midst of them and they will be a living, walking, breathing, touching demonstration of me on the earth today. I will fill them and they will do the same things that I did. Believers. But we have to see and we have to look and we have to care. And as you prepare later on to make the decision in which you want to give, listen, if you're praying about what to give and you have two amounts in your mind, choose the bigger amount. Say, well, that may be the devil. No, the devil will never tell you to give more money. The smaller amount, that's probably the devil. And understand, when when it's time to give, God's not trying to take anything from you. He's trying to get more to you. And the way that he brings more to you is as you sow, you reap. He gives you bread for food and seed for sowing. Don't eat your seed, sow your seed. Your future is in the seed that you sow. And any seed that you sow to reach the nations of the world, you are actively involved with the heart of God. You talk about a church being blessed. You talk about your businesses being blessed. You, you businessmen, you businesswomen, you want to see your, your businesses blessed? You want to see the favor of God get involved? So to where the heart of God is. If God begins to stir your hearts, it's not that he's trying to take anything from you. God's not a taker. He's a giver and he's a multiplier. All he's wanting you to do is to release something so he can multiply it and bring it back to you. Thank you for that. Amen. Ask the person next to you, are you hearing this? The Bible says when he saw her, he had compassion on you, on her. The compassion of God makes you available. See, when you look at someone, you make yourself available. When you make yourself available, it can make you nervous. A lot of people don't want to be nervous. A lot of people don't want to put themselves in a position where someone can expect from them. If we don't allow the world to expect from us, then who's going to bring change into the world? Yeah, but it makes me uncomfortable. That's okay. Get a little uncomfortable. God likes to make you a little nervous. 
You know what makes you nervous? Doing something that you haven't done before or maybe doing something bigger than what you've been doing in the past. How many of you remember the first time that you began to tithe, you were a little nervous? Nobody. Okay, I must be preaching to the wrong church. Come on, how many of you, when you first began to give and you knew it was God and you got a little excited, but you also got a little nervous? And your hand was, okay, Lord. See, when you do something for the first time, you get a little nervous. God likes to make you nervous. It gets you out of your comfort zone. Let me ask you, when's the last time you got nervous? Keep doing things for the first time. Try something new. If, if you've become comfortable in what you're doing, God says, listen, stretch it out a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to give a little bit more. But in this coming week, I'm praying it's not only going to be what you give with your hand, but God's going to bring somebody across your path, and he's going to show you someone, and, and you're going to want to look away, but I believe that God is going to heal your neck, and you won't be able to look away. You're going to look at them, and God's going to say, listen, speak to them. Say, say something to them. Release words. The words that we have in our heart coming out of our mouth is the incorruptible word of God, which lives and abides forever. And it doesn't matter what their persuasion is. It doesn't matter what their religious beliefs are. The gospel can invade the hardest heart, the darkest mind, and it can come in and it can bring life. Doesn't matter what you're, listen, when I went to church one night, when someone finally got me to church, because I grew up in church, I got tired of it because it was filled with old, ugly, boring people. And I walked away. I was a borderline alcoholic, strung out on drugs, working in a bar. That's my background. But I met Jesus. And when he stepped into my life with his light and his mercy and his love and his, and his compassion, he, he set me free and he totally changed my life. And he put a purpose on the inside of me. I used to be one of the most insecure, fearful people you could ever meet. Afraid to talk. That has changed. Uh, I am not. <laughs> I really like shoes. I think I have more shoes than my wife. <laughs> I'm an anointed shopper. And, and the reason I like shoes is because I was always looking down. Fear, insecurity, no value, no esteem, no confidence whatsoever. But you see, the gospel is not just a message. It's about a person. And this person, when we release by words, when we release the presence of God by touch, see, there's something supernatural in your touch. Is your body the temple of the Holy Ghost? Oh, that's pretty weak. Is your body the temple of the Holy Ghost? See, it's either the temple of the Holy Ghost or a prison for the Holy Ghost. Which one is it? Because if it's the temple of, that means there's a demonstration that life comes out. Life comes out of my mouth because out of the abundance of the heart, my mouth speaks. Not my words, his words. And his words are life. The spirit and their life. They do more than just touch heads and persuade minds. They go into the very core of a person's heart and they challenge and they break any kind of bondage and limitations that's on their life because the anointing breaks and destroys the, anoint the bondages. How does the anointing come forth? Not because you have a visiting evangelist that has power, but you have believers that are full of the Holy Ghost and they have words and they have a touch and they may be a little bit nervous, but they're willing to let God use them, touch somebody's life that's why you have miracles on the mission field why do you always have miracles on the mission field because you act different you go to another nation and you get crazy you get bold why nobody knows you You don't live there, and you know in eight days I'm going home, so I'm going to act as wild and crazy because I have no reputation to protect, and it doesn't matter what happened. In eight days, I'm leaving. I don't care. And so you say things, and you do things, and you act a certain way, 
And God shows up because there's a boldness, because there's no shame, there's no fear, and you have no reputation to try to protect. Can you imagine if you acted like that here? He would think, what's happened to you? You're acting a little crazy. No, I decided to be like Jesus because he considered himself of no reputation. He laid aside his glory. He wasn't worried about his reputation. Too many times we're worried about our reputation. Listen, I live in Asia. I understand the shame factor. It's one of the greatest hindrances to the gospel coming out because we're, we're, we're afraid that it might not work. We're afraid we might be embarrassed. Jesus looks at this woman and, and he says, Look, don't weep. Oh, wait a minute, my, my son's dead. And then he goes over to the coffin and he touches the coffin. And then he speaks to the boy who's dead. He said, little one, I say to you, arise. And the boy sat up. I bet that freaked everybody out when the boy sat up. Because you see, life confronts death. That's what the gospel does. Because he didn't step aside and go, sad. Life is coming one way. Death is coming another. But life sees. And life stops. And life speaks and life touches. Life always gives what it has. What's the result? At the end of the story, there's one crowd. And they're all following him. To me, this is a picture of the church. Because the world, the, the church is going one direction and we carry life. And the world is going another direction. And we meet. And as the church, we don't step aside and go, wow, sad. No, as the world, Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look. Come on, get your head up. Look and see. I want you to see the fields, they're, they're, they're white for harvest. I've sent you to reap where you have not labored. I've sent you to step into opportunities. I'm going to bring people across your path. And if you'll see what I see, then you'll step into an opportunity and a miracle can take place. If you'll take time to just release words. Listen, it doesn't take a lot of words. You don't have to be the greatest preacher. Listen, what changed and touched my life? Chapter one in the book, eight words. A young lady just told me, she says, Jesus loves you and he cares about your life. And those words just went right into my heart and confronted me. And I got wonderfully saved. Jonah, when he finally ended up in Nineveh, he didn't preach a fantastic message. He didn't declare, declare the glory of God. In fact, he walked through Nineveh and he just said, yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's all he said. Yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Eight words. That's all he said. Eight words. Eight words. And the entire city repented. You don't have to be the greatest preacher in the city. Maybe you have eight words Maybe you have a touch. Maybe you meet somebody at work and, and, and they're not feeling good. They're feeling sick or there's a sadness or there's a hopelessness and say, yeah, but, but they're not believers. It doesn't matter if they're believers. Pray for, every, pray for them. How many know God will do miracles for people that are not believers? How many know that everybody that Jesus healed in the gospels was not a believer? Nobody was born again until after Jesus was raised from the dead. God will heal unbelievers. He will do miracles in their life. And sometimes maybe it's a harvest you're going to reap or it's a seed that you're going to sow. But he wants you to see and he wants you to speak and he wants you to reach out. Two crowds at the gate at the end, just one crowd. And they're all following Jesus. Why? Because he saw her. 
It's my prayer that, now I, that doesn't mean in the coming week you are to interrupt a funeral. No, that's not what I'm saying. Oh, there's a funeral. I'm going to go stop it. No, that's not. Some people in everyday life, they carry a darkness and a sadness. And Jesus isn't just wanting to show up on Sunday morning. He wants to show up on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. He wants to show up in your world. He wants to show up where you work or where you go to school. He wants to show up in the marketplace. Our giving is not limited just... My wife, she's one of the most generous people I know. There's only four things that she will not give away. Our three children and me. I think she's been tempted with me a few times, but so far, so good. (laughs) She hasn't given me away yet. That's good. But I've watched her in grocery stores go up to people that you could tell that financially they're challenged. And she says, honey, give me your wallet. That's always a scary thing when she asks for my wallet. I've seen her give to people in grocery stores. We've been in restaurants where she was listening to someone talk that just came from a dentist's office and, 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 and over, overwhelmed by the amount it was going to cost to get their teeth fixed. And she goes, honey, let me have your wallet. I went, oh, I said, can I, can I pay for lunch first? She goes, no, just use a credit card. Give me your wallet. Okay. She has no mercy on my wallet. And she'll, and she'll take it and she'll just empty it. And she'll go over and she'll say, excuse me, and she'll sit down next to somebody in a restaurant. So I couldn't help but overhearing your conversation. I went, that's not true. You were listening on purpose. She goes, well, listen, my husband and I, we're, we're ministers. Beyond ministers, we just, we just love the Lord. And I want you to know that Jesus loves you and he cares about your life. Now, that can be a little nerving because you don't know how they're going to respond. You, know they're, they, you don't know if you're going to embarrass them or shame them or, reject, or they're going to reject you, but it's worth the risk. Here, I, I, just, I couldn't help but overhear what you were saying, and I know this doesn't pay for everything, but I just want you to know that God cares about your life and he loves you. It's an opportunity to invade someone's situation. See, that's what compassion does. And this is what the church is supposed to be like. Can you imagine going out into our communities with the compassion of God and looking around for an opportunity to speak to someone, to pray for someone, or to give to somebody that you don't even know? And you watch how God begins to move. Because listen, people are tired of sermons Tired of just another message and long preaching. What they want to see, what they want to feel, what they want to experience is Jesus real and demonstrated in everyday life. That's what our world needs. Real Jesus. Not a long, deep message. They want to see. They want to feel. They want to have an experience with the living, resurrected Savior. And I believe... In the coming days, you will have opportunities and you will remember this message and you'll go, you will see a situation, you'll see somebody and it will strike you and you'll go, this is what he was talking about. You'll you'll feel this pull on your heart. God will say, say something to them. What am I going to say? Just encourage them. Pray for that person. I, I don't know them. Pray for them. We were doing a meeting one time and we went into this uh, hardware store and it was, uh, the owner was Chinese and I could tell he was a Buddhist because it had the family portrait and it had the incense and, and all the other things there and, you know, and I, could, I, I knew he was a Buddhist and his little daughter was being carried around by a maid And her eyes were cross-eyed, so bad. It just made me dizzy to look at them. And on on the inside, I felt this, go ahead, pray for him. But he's, he's Buddhist, so? And the first thought will come, well, what if it doesn't work? Well, listen, if her eyes are cross-eyed, if it doesn't work, she's not gonna go deaf also. 
You know, she's not going to get worse. But I looked at this beautiful little girl and I thought, oh, how sad to have to go through life with your eyes so crossed that you, you, you just, you can't focus, you can't see. So I went over and then I asked permission. I said, excuse me, you have a beautiful, is, is this your daughter? And he goes, it's my granddaughter. I said, would you mind if, if I prayed for her? I just believe that God really wants to touch her life and straighten out her eyes. Sure. I, I don't have to touch her, but if you would allow, I just put my hand on her gently. Which she was kind of scared, big, tall, white guy coming up, stranger. So I just gently put my hand on her and I said, Lord, touch this little girl. For her sake and her grandfather. Let him know you love him. He had no faith. And so we prayed for her. Her eyes straightened right out. And the grandfather, with tears, held her. I walked out of that store. It was one of the, <laughs> it was a great day. But it was always a risk. I believe God wants you to begin to take some risks. Come on, somebody say amen. Because if not, then your Christianity becomes dull and boring and routine. And that's not what it's all about. That's not the kind of Jesus we take into our world. That's not the unstoppable gospel that brings changes to hearts and minds and bodies and breaks bondages. But there has to be a people that aren't just this bold and crazy, but they are just filled with compassion and just they make themselves available. And when you make yourself available to allow things to touch your heart. Listen, if God's got your heart, he's got your wallet. Come on. Yeah, see, because the direction to your wallet is through your heart. Once God has your heart, he's got you. When he has you, he has who you are. He has what you have. And then your life and your Christianity and your walk becomes a living adventure. Not dull, not boring, not routine. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the people here in Glad Tidings. I thank you that you want to move in their lives. I thank you that out of their innermost being flows life. I thank you that their words carry life, their touch carries life, their giving carries life. In their giving, you take something that is paper, you take something that is physical, you take something that is natural and temporary, and you use it to do something that is supernatural and eternal and spiritual. You take a little boy's lunch and you multiply it because you're going to meet needs. And I thank you that as people begin to give and sow into the nations of the world, as it's released from their hand, it gets multiplied and the needs in these nations are met. But the return is greater than what they began with. Only you can take a little boy's lunch and end up with 12 baskets left over more than what they ever started with. Because your hand and your touch and your multiplication is upon the release. The release of our words. The release of our touch. The release of our praying. The release of our giving. Bring a multiplication in this church because you bring a multiplication into these lives. Let us be that crowd that's following life. And out of this crowd, let life flow. The touches and changes, darkness and hopelessness. And makes Jesus real. 
here in Malaysia and the nations of the world. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.